Welcome to the Shame Free Zone. I'm Veronica Monet, and my guest today is Jules Kostasu. I am a huge fan of hers. I actually own three of her Venus mats. She is the creatrix of the famous Venus mats. And if you haven't heard of them, you are really, really missing out. Um, I use them for female ejaculation because I am a very profuse female ejaculator, but you can use them for birthing, for sex during menstruation. Um, there's a lot of uses for them. As a matter of fact, I'm just going to welcome Jules to the show right now so she can tell you a little bit about it. Jules, welcome to the Shame Free Zone. Thank you so much. I love that. Shame Free. Yes, I'm all for it. It was such a pleasure to be invited and to know you now over the years and to feel uh, a sister. I don't want to say sister in arms, although it is Memorial Day, so there's a sort of war metaphors going on, but a sister in the pleasure revolution and mm. a very necessary work to liberate a full sexual expression across the board for women and men. And I yeah. think it's going to help us make sense of this crazy world. Well, and I just, I see you as a YRS that's out there on the front lines busting shame right and left because I can't think of anything more shameful the way our culture is set up than bodily fluids. Mm -hmm. And you give us permission to have them, uh, to talk about them, and even go so far as to celebrate them. I think that's really profound, Jules. It's true. I, I have to say, when I first launched Venus Matters five years ago, I found myself in conversations, often with people of the opposite sex, talking about body fluids and having a, a moment of like, <gasps> I'm talking about periods with some marketer and, and how does that, how's that landing? And, and the truth is, though, the more I talk about it, the, the less shame is there. And I think that that's just, what a, what a crazy trick we've been played upon the body to feel that we can't or we have to hide our our natural excretions i mean of course we eat fantastically delicious feasts and yet you know we all know what happens on the other end but it's all so distasteful and can never be mentioned and that's just silliness that has to go the way of of the 20th century and all the things that need to be dropped like shame and and instead to really embrace what miraculous organisms we have to play in and to, and to wake up in. And, Absolutely. And, yeah. you know, so I, I see when I put your Venus mat down on my bed, I feel that I'm creating um, a sacred space for what follows. Uh, and, of course, it doesn't hurt that they're gorgeous and it doesn't hurt that they're sensuous to lie on. Um, but it really, for me, sets the stage for what, what is going to happen on this Venus mat is beautiful and, um, and associated with something that I consider sacred because uh, my sexuality is, is, is part of my spirituality. And um, yeah, so I just want to thank you. Thank you for being such an integral part of my sensuous um, existence. Mm, such an honor. Sometimes my partner and I like to imagine how many people are making love on Venus mats at that particular moment. And it's, it's an incredible honor to be able to help lay that sacred space. And I think especially in, in our world that's more and more secular and, and there's so little ritual space, to make it easy for people to create something just immediately uplifting and alchemical and beautiful that creates a special energy. I think one of my favorite stories is when a, a, a customer saw her Venus match. She was picking it up at my house and she had been abused as a, as a younger woman. And she said, when I lay this Venus mat down, sex will be on my terms. So she had the sense of how she was going to claim that sacred space for herself and that that inspired me really to make an intention that abuse would never occur on a Venus mat. There would be always respectful and honoring pleasure and sexual activity. Wow. I actually put a lump in my throat because I'm an incest survivor and a rape survivor. 
Um, and I hadn't thought about that, but that probably is part of it too. Yeah. It's just that this is volitional and it's empowered. And uh, if I'm getting my Venus mad out, I've made a, a decision, a choice. Hmm. I'm, a, I'm a, a, you know, a creator of this. So can you tell our viewers all that I know that I don't understand all the uses there are for the Venus mat because uh, I use mine almost primarily for ejaculation, but would love to hear what other uses there are for it. I think that probably is our greatest customer base. And I wasn't expecting that in the beginning. I had originally come up with the idea because I wanted to have sex on my period one afternoon and I found myself looking for an old towel or something to put on the bed so I wouldn't make a mess. And I had been raised by hippies and told that my period was going to be the most wonderful thing. And becoming a young woman was going to be this empowered, incredible thing. So I didn't have shame or guilt around my period, but I did have just this slight, subtle sense of why am I looking for something ugly and some, some dirty towel, you know, an old towel to make love on. Why isn't there something for this moment? For me, and that's what was really the the seed of the business. Wow. For my, um, it was probably years before I came up with my first prototype. But that is certainly one use. The other use that's really near and dear to my heart is for young girls who first get their period, and they can often have very heavy periods when they first start menstruating. And I wanted to really give something to young girls that also made them feel that they were in control, that they didn't have to worry, they could sleep easily, they had something that was cool and beautiful, but also super practical. And so I haven't been able to reach that market as much as I'd like to, but one of my friend's young daughters says she, every month she sleeps on her Venus mat and all of her friends also want them too, because like, oh my God, that's so cool. I've, that, where can I get that? So that was uh, definitely another use around periods. The, the one that also, I absolutely love is for mothers who often will, if, if you're not even home birthing, sometimes your water will break while you're at home before you get to the hospital. I had a friend whose water broke on her Venus mat. She came home to a completely dry mattress. She was very happy about that. But also if you are going to do home birthing, they're incredibly absorbent and will help keep that you know, process in a, a much cleaner place. Also after birth, a lot of women feel kind of, um, it's not talked about much, but after birth, you often are just this jamboree of body fluids. You know, you're cut, there's bleeding, there's leaky nipples. And then of course your baby is also having all kinds of body fluids. So a lot of mothers then sleep on their Venus mats with their babies oh. and they do a lot less laundry. And then let's see, of course, there's female ejaculators. My, some of my favorite yeah. favorite reviews come from women who either had a little bit of shame or had their first squirting orgasm on a Venus mat and suddenly feel completely free to just let themselves be utterly uninhibited during sex. But I think the final use of them, which is, is also something I haven't really, you know, worked toward at, yet but it's um to help around the, the dying process as well yeah people have of course issues with their body fluids while they're dying and that can be humiliating and painful and difficult for the people taking care mm -hmm. of them and one of my actually my stepmother's mother uses her a small venus mat on her um on her wheelchair and on her couch and so she doesn't have to worry about little leaks and things and I think there's definitely the whole spectrum of of possibilities there. I think one of our early mottos was honoring all of life cycles, so from birth to death and everything in between. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I think of a couple other uses, by the way, and one is male ejaculation. Yes. Um, you know, yeah, sure, you can clean it up with a piece of tissue, but I, I think not being worried about where it's going to go can really be freeing and, and help accentuate the orgasmic uh, moment. Mm -hmm. And, and the other thing that just occurred to me when I was listening to you talk, you know, is um, 
some people, not myself actually, but some people enjoy anal sex. Actually, quite a few people do. Um, and sometimes that can get a little bit messy and, you know, people put down towels so that they don't stain their sheets. But mm -hmm. if they used a Venus mat, it just goes into the laundry and you don't have to worry about staining it. One of the other uses I have is when I get out of a bath, you know, you get sort of hot and, and you're still kind of shedding water after a bath. I just plop down on my Venus mat on the bed and it, it just absorbs everything. And then I'm oh. That's fine. Yeah. Just, it's just the kind of celebration of being in the human body. Yes. Yeah. Well, now you also, you, um, you have a, a blog and you recently wrote about some uh, relationship tips, um, six steps to more love and more passion, or I think actually it's more pleasure, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Do you want to tell you us a little bit about more pleasure that? in your life, right? That's well, it's Yeah. Good. <laughs> need and it's not always it's one of those things where if you go directly after it sometimes it, you can it can kind of run away like if you want if you want more pleasure and especially if you're maybe a little too focused on just one type of pleasure it can become a, a chase or a, a, a kind of a not not as easily um um accomplished if you're just going for pleasure. So I, I wrote this six step guide as a way of kind of creating the context for pleasure, creating, creating like a whole understanding of how to cultivate pleasure in a relationship where it just more naturally arises instead of trying to force it to be there when you want to have sex. Oh, well, do tell. So what's step one? Well, step one is a super easy, but often overlooked step, which is to appreciate where so no matter what's going on, no matter any things are left undone on your to-do list, there has to be a sense of, all right, I'm going to appreciate this moment, appreciating what is. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to create a, a, a sort of baseline of being present and being grateful that you're alive, that you've got your partner or even if you're just self-pleasuring that you're that you're that you're on this planet at this time in this body and then from that place of appreciation you can is really the only way to begin yeah yeah and it's especially hard to do when you're missing out on something or if you're complaining or you're feeling like you you're lacking something but even in the midst of a pandemic there's so much that we can be grateful for there's so much that we can appreciate and the feeling of appreciation is just fundamental to loving relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, I think that's a really important place to start, Jules, because I've, I find a lot of times that, um, you know, as a relationship coach and a sexologist, the people that I'm helping are kind of chasing and grasping and trying to get. And um, I know for a fact that if you're trying to have an orgasm, that's going to make it more difficult. Hmm. Um, and I, I think the same applies to pleasure. We want to get into the flow and allow. And gratitude's a beautiful place to relax ourselves into the flow. Yeah, and I think that ties into sort of the beginning of our conversation because we seem to we, we tend to overlook how miraculous our bodies are. I mean, we we are the leading cutting edge of millions and billions of years of evolution. We have these fantastic organs of that can see color and the sensation of our skin. And I mean, it, it, the, the magnificence of the human body is, is really easily kind of dropped in all of the busyness and all the ways we dress it up. But the little small ways that we can appreciate being in a body and appreciate another person's body is it's just, it creates so much material and so much nourishment that I really love starting and staying a long time in that step. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. What is step two? So step two is initiate. And I think this is the other part that maybe it, it's perhaps more um, visible now as we're all being sort of locked in our homes to varying degrees. I think we can get locked in our own belief systems and we can get locked in our own um, private worlds internally. And we 
we there can be this gap, this chasm that develops between people. And there are these things you can't talk about. And there are the, the, the old resentments or there are all sorts of things that we, we end up not sharing what's really going on inside of us. Mm. And so the initiation is this ability to, to throw a line across the divide to say, you know what, this feels like I should be, I should be, um, protecting this part of me, or I don't know how you're going to react. I don't know if it's, a, if it's okay to talk about this, but to find a way to bring the walls down inside and initiate across the divides. Mm. That to me is, you know, it's, it's easy to feel like we're sharing ourselves on social media because we get to create posts and photographs that are kind of perfect and dialed in and tell the, the, the nice story. But actually to initiate from a vulnerable open place is one of the most erotic and hot things you can do in a relationship. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think about this, uh, kind of what I consider a pornified culture. And I, I say that without judgment um, because I've produced and appeared in porn, but I, I think that it has sometimes defined our sexuality and shaped our sexuality in ways that haven't been helpful. And um, one of them to me is this idea of kind of observing yourself instead of being that vulnerable, flawed human being. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I've worked with uh, both men and women, but especially women sometimes, who are just really trying to uh, look a certain way or act a certain way instead of being. And, mm -hmm. and what I'm hearing with your step two there is that we're, um, we're kind of letting that facade go. Mm -hmm. and allowing ourselves to really step into being authentic. Is that, is that kind of what you were communicating? Yes, absolutely. And yeah. what, what and would be the I think it, it plays in beautifully with your work around the shame-free zone. If you're, if you're able to share something that you're scared about, the shame can just evaporate. It can, it, as soon as you're able to say, I feel a little scared or I feel a little tender here, in that moment, often the shame will, will, will fall away. That's exactly what happens. I get, I get emails, um, you know, usually several times a day. Somebody is just kind of sending me a little message, kind of dumping their shame at my doorstep, which I totally welcome. And I reply back basically, you know, you're loved and you're, mm -hmm. you're a good, valuable human being. And they don't even need to book a session with me. <laughs> Feeding yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't. I, I, I want everything to be shame free. The world would be a much less violent, hateful place if we had less shame. Mm. So, yeah. so Jules, what would step three be? Well, let's see. Step three is negotiate because I think the fact of the matter is we have differences. We have we have things that don't always line up in our desires, and instead of seeing conflict or difference as something that's going to take us out of the game or be a reason to go to our corners again once we've opened those those difficult conversations or initiated you know our own vulnerability across the divides we then get to say oh how can we how can we create a win-win here there isn't i think one of the great movements of our time is to move away from zero sum games where one person wins and the other person loses or right. You know where an orgasm has to occur for for both people to have a sense of successful sex that there there's there's a way of negotiating and uh finding win-wins that yeah. can can go into so many different areas outside of sexuality but just in terms of like dates and dinner and housework you know to get to, to find our, our strength in overcoming conflicts and differences with negotiations and with accepting those differences and talking about them in ways that are playful and fun. So one of the things that I think would be is really fun is to create a bunch of your ideal dates. Of course, now that we're in quarantine, nobody's really going anywhere, but you could do it also in terms of sex acts and, and things you want to explore. 
And then you have a little party planning night where you write down all the different things you could do and then throw all of them into a hat and you pick a couple of them and see which ones light both of your eyes up. Yeah. So you find those things that might be a little bit of a stretch or a little bit of an edge, but that are fun for you both, that you're both willing to explore together. Well, people are still doing online dating. As a matter of fact, they're getting very creative about that. Sometimes they, they go out to dinner and have drinks, but they do it online. So they, they just, you know, do a Zoom like you and I are doing right now, only they're across from each other having a date. So mm -hmm. I think that they could still do what you're talking about, throwing all the ideas into a hat. Um, they just have to take turns picking out of their hats, maybe. Mm -hmm. But that, that's I think the other really important part about that one I've just been researching it myself is the quarantine has shown people or couples the disparity in who does the housework and who takes care of the kids and who helps with the child rearing and, this, and the homeschooling. And yeah women in general are still doing about twice as much and the majority of the lead of the education of the children i mean of course these are generalizations but these studies are pretty widespread indicators that there's still a pretty strong gender bias around taking care of the home and i know for me if my man is helping me clean things up and and really helping me in the kitchen and being a partner with me and negotiating the work that needs to be done in the house as a partner, it is a huge turn on. Uh, yes, there's a lot of women who feel that housework is the best way to uh, create interest in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the last thing a man thinks would work, but, but if he can you know, scry into her enjoyment of it, yeah. and understand that it isn't that it isn't that he's having to, you know, get things done to get sex. It's actually that it's enjoyable. It's part of, for me, part of going back to what the Venus mat does. When you tend to your space and you create beauty, like a beautiful meal or just a gorgeous flower arrangement, when you create that intentionality in the space, yeah. there's more room for pleasure and connection and intimacy. Everyone in the space feels taken care of. Everyone in the space feels elevated. And that... And, and that's a big that's a big deal actually with the couples that I work with uh what comes up uh, sometimes is that she's doing too much of the housework uh you know more than her share for sure uh and more of the child care and she's just tired yeah um so sharing the household um chores and child care is a is a surefire way to improve the sex life because then both people have more energy and to take the shame out of it again, I think a useful way to approach this is just write down all, all the things that need done and all the things that are getting done. And of course, some of those things are invisible. You know, the, the making sure that the kids feel nurtured and loved or, you know, the, the more the more maybe a feminine side of things, but, but to figure out a way to make visible, even the invisible work. Absolutely. And then create a neutral place to say, well, here's what has to get done. Well, how, what are you going to commit to? How can I commit to this and, and share that in ways that are just more above board? But that kind of negotiation goes a long, long way. It does. It does. So that's really important step. What is step four? Let's see. Step four is resonate. So this is one of my favorite musical ideas. There's a, a term called the, um, let's see, here it is the sympathetic resonance. Any note that sounded on a guitar or a piano would sound completely hollow and thin if all the notes with their difference. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we're doing in relationship. I'm sounding the note of my being as purely, as bravely as I can. And then my lover has a d another note. Mm -hmm. The trouble is, are we both resonating? Am I, am I really sounding my note or am I second guessing myself? Am I even aware of what I'm feeling and desiring and, and, and what I'm needing? Mm -hmm. I think, I know I tend to fall out of myself and get paid too much attention to the people around me and I forget my own note. I forget to sound my own note. But then sometimes the opposite is true where I'm just all in my own deal and, I, and I'm kind of unaware of, of my impact on the others around me. 
And so that resonance is this more subtle uh, tuning into both knowing myself and feeling wherever I am in my body and also allowing the other person's experience to sound out and to pay attention to what note they're sounding and how I can resonate with what they're sounding. You know, that actually, I, I can think of something uh, just like during sex, um, you know, we, we make noises, some of us more than others, um, but harmonizing those or, mm -hmm. or hitting the same notes. I, I'm thinking about Sherry Winston. She wrote a fabulous um, sex manual called Women's Anatomy of Arousal. Maybe you've read it or heard of it. Um, she talks about how important sound is to our orgasmic pleasure. Um, and in my experience, when um, the people that are having sex with each other are kind of matching each other's sounds, hmm. that that actually amplifies um, the pleasure and the connection. That's so true. Yeah. 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 I, I think that's, uh, that's something sometimes what happens is, you know, your, your lover is in a, in a bad mood or is angry about something and you, you don't care about it. You know, it's, you, you weren't, someone didn't cut you off in traffic or it, it's not your issue. Yeah. And if they sound that note of anger and frustration and you're just like, yeah, okay, sorry about that. You know, you, and you don't take a moment of, of saying, wow, you're angry. I, I get that you're angry or, you know, I, I'm, I'm hearing you loud and clear. Mm. Then that whatever they're feeling might start to struggle and kind of, and become even more difficult or more entrenched. Whereas if you can resonate and really see in that moment, wherever your partner is and say, keeping your own tone, you don't have to, fall into their emotional states by any means, but you can, so you can anchor yourself in, in whatever you're feeling, but also fully allow them to be where they are and resonate and hold that space for them. Yeah. Then the, in that moment, the, the emotion, the difficulty might more easily pass because they've, it's been received. It's been witnessed. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I usually, I, th I, th I think that you calling that resonant is it, it puts a, a new twist on something that I usually refer to as empathetic listening, active listening, validating. Um, and, um, what I like about the way that you're expressing that is that, um, it kind of puts our focus on how our, um, if, if all we're doing is, okay, I hear you, and is this what you're saying? And uh, I, I totally get why you'd feel that way. And um, there's, there's some way, and we're still kind of over here. Mm -hmm. But I think if we're resonating, we actually are sharing their angst or their pain or their fear or their sadness or their frustration or their anger. We're kind of in it with them. It, which can be really scary, I think, for some people, because you don't want, like if someone's experiencing an emotional meltdown, you don't want to get caught up in it necessarily. Mm -hmm. You might not even agree with it. Mm -hmm. But if you can anchor yourself in your own resonance, in your own tone, and fully allow that to vibrate with them, it's a, it's a very different experience. And being a, a very emotional person, I, I worked with this with my partner over the years, and it's it's incredible how good he's gotten at letting my emotional storms not only come, but also like letting them rage. Like, is there anything else you need to get out? Like, I, you must, that must have been so infuriating. Like, just give it, give me more. Let, let it, let it really sound. And then it can transform. I Aww. think mm. the resistance and the staying over here and maybe even doing some good, you know, what sounds like good listening. I hear that you're upset, but there's no real resonance. That can actually create a, a much more difficult emotional uh, flow. And I think that the resonance ends up making it, I found that even my most difficult emotions when they're, when they're held in that way, that they're not only heard, but accepted and, yeah. and even validated, they so easily should. You know, Jules, I, th I think this is a, a missing component for me. I'm an empath, so is my partner. So we don't have any problem 
resonating with each other's emotions. It really comes natural to us. But in coaching couples, I have sometimes, I've, I've taken them through the active listening, validating, um, and they, what I find is that um, sometimes it doesn't have that empathy to it, right? It's kind of hollow and it, it doesn't have the same effect. So I, yeah. I think what you're pointing out is it's really helpful. I, and I, I'm, I'm going to find some ways to, to communicate to that to my you know, clients who are perhaps not empaths like I am. So maybe it's, a, it's more difficult to talk about it in a way because it's more on the being side of things, you know, because we're, we're so easily in our head and we're maybe saying the right words or we want to say the right words to each other. But it's really about a being and, and yeah. that awareness and that depth of, of co-resonance. Because I, I do feel like it's, it's really easy to slip into codependence instead. Yes. As an empath, it's easy to kind of get overblown by other people's emotions or other people's situations. And we still want to maintain our own resonance with our own anchor, our own core. Absolutely. I think that's one of the reasons sometimes we can recoil from our partner's emotions because we're afraid we're going to get drug into it. Um, or maybe we see that it's less than optimum re response to the current situation. So, and we can kind of polarize or judge. And if you are really solid in where you're going to stay um, and still be able to open this door to really relate to this other person's experience, very powerful. Yes. Yeah. Very, very powerful to be held in that way. So what is step five? Step five is consecrate. And this is really what you were saying about your Venus mats, that it's, Absolutely. Create a, a special time and a special place to, to come together mm -hmm. and, and explore your pleasure and your sex. And for about a, six months or so, my partner and I have been really working on our date nights and creating a special time that like it, we both have it in our calendars, we get our announcements, you know, it's our hot date night, it's coming up, it's in a half an hour, it's now. And at that moment, we drop everything and we create a special time and space to be together. And it has improved our sex life enormously. It's just wonders for creating space and time to explore and not have to chase orgasms or not be frustrated that you know it's it's late at night or early in the morning and you know we've actually created a, a beautiful little window in time where we get to do new things and or or do bold things one thing one rule we have is we we don't watch television because we want to really be focused on each other but we can make a beautiful meal or massage each other or maybe even work in the garden or yeah. find things to do that that are nourishing and that are fun and that that some of that negotiation work can come in there too where we can pull a new slip out of the hat that will take us both to a new edge. So I'm wondering if um, part of date night is um, the anticipation, the titillation? Definitely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's funny because when I first initiated this, this practice, my partner was making fancy dinner reservations and kind of trying to make a, a, a big show of a, of a date, a great date. And yeah. I had to really dial it in with them to say that, you know, what's mo what would be even more fun for me would be for us to just have a massage table and, and spend a half an hour massaging each other or do some eye gazing or just spend time just breathing together. Mm -hmm. That, that isn't about going out and doing something or having some great bottle of wine or, and that simplicity has, has become a real anchor for us. And it's, it's wonderful too, because we have to say no to invitations or tell his kids that no, we're having a date night. And one, his daughter wanted to come by for um, one Thursday a couple of weeks ago. And, and I thought what a great thing for her to hear that his, her dad has a date night with me, that, what a, that, that I deserve that and that she deserves that and that we all deserve that consecrated ritualized time that isn't just snuck in between before we get up and have to do something else or 
when we're finally getting into bed. Yes, I, 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 I'm so um, sad, actually. I think I'm sad about how often people are just trying to fit the sex into their schedule. Um, you know, first thing in the morning, last thing at night or something. But, um, and I read some kind of disturbing statistics about how long people devote to sex. And um, on average, apparently it's about a half an hour, um, which- um, Each time they have sex or half an hour? Half an hour for, for sex. For, for, okay. Yeah. That seems kind of long. I would think for many people, it's actually even shorter than that. Oh, for many people it is, but that was an average. Huh. Uh, and, and, and I try to encourage my clients to set aside at least an hour. Um, I, um, in my own personal life, um, three to five hours feels a lot more comfortable. But, you know, what do you consider sex? If, if you just think sex is intercourse, then of course... Um, that might feel too long, but mm -hmm. if, if the whole lovemaking thing, you know, and you're doing a lot of different things and stopping to connect with each other and have conversation and go back to lovemaking, it becomes a, a beautiful banquet, a beautiful feast and not something that you mm -hmm. want to rush. So it's, I, I, I believe a lot of your uh, audience is men, right? Oh, uh, no, no. Oh, really? Not. Well, I, was, I listened, I heard some really interesting research about um, women who are not as interested in sex yeah. often experience sex as purely intercourse. And so if you're involved with someone who doesn't want to have sex with you as much as you'd like to have sex, it, yeah. I would think it would be a really smart move to broaden that experience for them so that they're, they have a lot more inroads and onroads to yeah. being with you because... If it's just intercourse, there, I know there's a part of me that's just like, I'm not as interested. I want to have a full, a much fuller experience. Yeah, actually. So just to be clear, um, I have clients and subscribers of all uh, uh, genders. And I'm probably, as far as subscribers, a little heavy on the uh, female. Uh, oh. so I, I do a lot of webinars uh, huh. geared towards women. So, um, but... Uh, clients, I'm, I'm working mostly with heterosexual monogamous couples, um, and I'm bisexual and polyamorous, but anyway, <laughs> you know, here nor there, but, um, I certainly am open to working with people of all different kinds of relationship, um, gender and sexual orientations, but the vast majority of people tend to be pair bonded, um, around heterosexual and I have found that there is this, this tug of war a lot of times where he wants more sex more often and, and she is either too tired or kind of bored with the way the sex is going. I think getting a, a Venus mat could actually be a great way to break free of that for a lot of women because she's kind of taking ownership of herself and she's also maybe hopefully trying to break free of some of the programming around not making a mess mm -hmm. and um, looking pretty while you're having sex um, or performing like a porn star, whatever, whatever the script is. So, um, I and it's a signaler man too, like she puts the Venus mat down on the, on the bed. It's a, it's a clear signal that things can get messy. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it can. Yes, it can. And, and just, you know, statistically the a majority of women do not experience um, orgasm during intercourse. Um, so it, totally if, if that is the definition of sex, then that's probably going to cause a lot of women to feel less drawn towards having sex. So it's, um, it's really crucial that we mm. broaden our perspective on what is lovemaking because it's, it's yes. so much more and it's, it's breathing, it's, it's Tantra, it's learning how to touch and have an embodied touch, um, it's, it's oral sex. It's um, um, it, absolutely intercourse is something I love, but that's just a small part of it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, this is really the impetus for writing this, this piece was to, to broaden that approach because 
I have to say the other day I made love with my partner and we had gotten through some, just a little bit of a conflict the night before and he just created such a beautiful soul resonating moment for me. And, and he ended up making love with me so passionately and so beautifully that I realized that this whole idea of did I come or did I not come was, was, completely insignificant like it didn't even it didn't even register because every way he every moment he touched me the moment he entered me it all felt profoundly orgasmic and pleasurable and I didn't have to there was no, no getting to something else but the only way that encounter happened was because there was so much resonance happening there was there was so much appreciation there was so much there was such a, a soulful stand that he was making for me and for my evolution and for my growth and i felt so seen and so loved by him that so, passion was just on top of all of this yes underlying intimacy and i think i guess that's really the the core of what i'm these these steps get to, are getting to is how into how can you, how can you, how much can you bring your energy into your body, even when you're not touching? And yeah. can you, can you infuse your words with that intimacy and with that acceptance and appreciation and discovery of the other person? Oh, some, some erotic highs don't involve orgasms at all. Um, it's, it's so much about the passion the connection, the, um, the spiritual connection and um, being in sync with each other and also learning how to move the energies inside yourself. Um, I find that um, meditation and yoga can be really good. Um, Kundalini yoga in particular, because there's so much emphasis on um, pranayams and you know which is the breathing where we're raising kundalini mm -hmm. energy up and you can literally breathe yourself into an orgasm you don't even have to have genitals to have fire breath orgasms um and or access to your genitals i know because I've, I've worked with people who are quadriplegic or not every quadriplegic has the same symptoms but some people are not able to access genital sensation mm -hmm. they can still have orgasms because it's an energetic thing and when two people come together this is why people who do kundalini yoga like to be in the same room because they're raising that energy together mm -hmm. you have two people who are making love raising that um, energy um, it can be a static but very much not the definition that a lot of us have for sex which is sad to me because sex is a huge container big container as big as our bodies as big as as the human experience and i, I think even for those people who don't necessarily have a spiritual um, commitment or understanding the fact that we're alive for me the fact that these bodies do what they do is magnificent and miraculous and that they're going to die we're, we're all going to perish at some point. And so how much can we be loved up and loved in our bodies while we have them? You know, Jules, one of the things that occurred to me was how we, to me, a static lovemaking um, can take me out of my body where, mm. I feel, where I feel merged with my partner and the divine. It's just, it's, it's an amazing experience. Um, and I always thought the irony that we use the body to free ourselves of the body. Mm. And that to me is almost a spiritual practice. Well, I'd have to say it is a spiritual practice of mine. Just, you know, that's why I call sex my, my spiritual path because um, I'm, I'm, my goal is to uh, experience intimacy and connection that sometimes the body actually precludes where the body can kind of create a barrier for us, but we can use the body to raise those energies and merge in ways that I experience is beautiful. Mm. Yeah. So, okay. I think we're to step six now. You're, you're keeping good count. Yeah. But we've really been talking about it. It's uh, the satiation of this life of this body to really allow ourselves to slow down and satiate and, and relish what we've created. Because if, 
if we really are appreciating what's happening, even when we don't like it, finding a way to appreciate it and yes it. Mm. And then, and then let's see, I forgot the first, uh, and then initiating across those divides that come up, you know, finding ways to, to negotiate around differences and resonate energetically in our bodies. And then we're creating sacred spiritual, you know, sacred space to, to actually practice lovemaking. Then you really are at the point of satiating and relishing it. Like you're going to, you're creating a garden of delights there. And that is really key what you're talking about because I have clients who are engaging in lots of sex and they're not satiated. They're mm. feeling empty. They're feeling disconnected. They're feeling really frustrated. They keep thinking, well, if I do this or we do that, maybe it'll feel better. And it's not working. Um, and I, I have such an appreciation for these six steps that you've laid out for us because I too am teaching people, you want to have better sex. Let's work on the emotional connection with each other it's so important because if you don't have that then you're not going to have that sense of connection mm -hmm. and you probably won't have a sense of satiation either so i just uh, i love that you've laid this out this way and and i also love the way you're embracing the human body from birth to death it's just gorgeous Oh, it's it's a pleasure to find fellow conspirators, and <laughs> it's great that you know that we're we're emerging from a period from several millennia of just outrageous controls on the body on women and yeah. an enormous amount of shame and and denial of of this the miracle that we exist, and now we're. We're here to explore a whole new side of it and hopefully to become much more cognizant of the co-creation that's possible now if we're really paying attention and yeah. being being to each other. Well put. I think we are running out of time here. So I want all of our um, viewers to know how to get their own Venus mat and also where they can find these six steps on your website. So Jules, can you tell them how they can find you? Sure, just go to venusmatters.com and the blog is just at the bottom of all our five-star reviews. So you can just keep scrolling down and you'll see this particular blog piece along with a few others. Yeah, and I, it's also gonna be listed at the bottom of this video too. Oh, thank you. Jules, I just, I, I feel like you were right in here with me marching to bust shame and create a world that is not only pleasure oriented, but oriented towards intimate, meaningful connection. Hmm. Yeah. And it's been to say, make love, not war. Make love, not war. It has not gone out of style. <laughs> Thank you, Jules. Thanks so much for joining me in the shame-free zone.